You are now watching a continuation of the previously aired video. There are some things that you're going to have to add to your eyes if you're going to see. I have to drop drops in my eyes uh, twice a day. I have to drop two drops in the morning, one drop in the evening. And I am so delinquent. I'm a very bad patient. And so I'm putting the blame on my granddaughter. And when they go to the doctor, the doctor say, uh, are you taking the drops? I say, um, not so good because my granddaughter is not always available to drop them in. <laughs> you know, that's like you saying you can't pay your electric bill because you don't have a bill. The postman didn't bring a bill. That's nonsense. Who needs bills to pay bills these days? Uh, you go to the store and say, my name is Lester Merlin. They say, okay, you, know, you owe $500. But listen to so, so some things the Lord said that we need to drop in our eyes if we're going to see. You're with me this morning? We're not talking sugar cake message this morning. We're going a little bit deeper. Let's bring it up. God has given us this verse says, exceeding great and precious promises. And by these promises, we become partakers of the divine nature. Look at verse 5. Verse 5. I like this. And besides this, besides that, the fact that God has given us all things, giving all diligence, that means making an effort. Brother, I don't know. I'm not God, but I'm a fruit inspector. God has called me to be a pastor. I'm supposed to watch like a shepherd. And as I watch over the church, I don't see much diligence. People are not diligent. People are not making effort. I watch children going to school these days as they travel by Dayton Griffith and Foundation or whatever. And in my day when I went to school, people, the children even used to look intelligent, even if they were dumb. They used to look intelligent. The ones that are going to school today, I mean, it's quarter past nine, they're sauntering. I'll be running, I'll be running, I'll, I'll be running barefoot, no shoes. I'll be running to get to school. And you pass these, no diligence at all. So my granddaughter said to me, granddaddy, you don't understand what's happening. There's no point in going to school these days. School is bare stress. I said, well, get stressed out for five years, get a degree, and live up to 80 without stress. Take the stress now where you can take it. You understand what I'm saying? I say that to say when they look over the church, I don't see the diligence. Let me, let me make this easier and read from verse 5 in the New Living Translation. We're going to upgrade. We're going to upgrade. Sometimes you wonder why we use so many different translations. Because one Greek word could mean a whole lot of stuff. In English, we only have one word for love. I love my wife. I love the dog. I love the car. Love. In Greek, there are four different words. So one translation would use agape, another translation would use Philadelphia, another translation would use exotic, the exotic love, and another translation would use torge. And all four of those loves are different because you don't, you shouldn't love your dog like you love your wife. So that's why we have these different translations. Look at this. In view of all this, make every effort. Brother, are you making, you don't even make effort to come to church. How many of you are going to make effort to be back here at 6.30 this evening? We are blind or short-sighted because we think that God making fun. I'm going to say this every week, even if you get angry, because if you had a business, you would want to get your customers back to your business. And you'll be making ads and all that. And I'm saying that it is God who said that we should not forsake the assembly of ourselves together. It's God who said, but we are so blinded or we are so short-sighted that we don't care if we go to church. We don't care if God said that or not. We don't care. Listen, Monica, could you save this? I'm coming back here. 2 Peter 1, 5. And let's go up to Hebrews 10, 26. We're talking about being blind. If these things, the Bible said, if these things are in you that we're going to read. Listen. Verse 27. Verse 25. I'm looking at the verse where it says that we, let us not, let's, you see, this is what God says. Who cares about that? You are so blind that you don't realize that this, missing out this could cause you to lose up with the Lord. Huh? Let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. We are so blind. This is what, we, this is what we're going to talk about tonight. The signs of Christ's coming. And the church is not aware of it. We are involved in all kind of activity. Let me ask a question. Don't lie to me. 
How many of you could quote John 3, 17? You're not going to quote it. Just wave my hand if you can. John 3, 17. Only two hands went up. Let me ask you a question. How many of you could tell me the horse that won the race yesterday? Like, raise your hand. Don't be embarrassed. Raise your hand. You see, you see the things we you see the things that interest us. We know the horse that won the Coxburg Go Cup. It's Coxburg or Sandy Lane. Sandy Lane. But we don't know John 3 17. We're blind. We're short sighted. We're interested in the wrong things. You must excuse this one, but pardon me, I gotta say this. Very seldom do I walk, walk to church. And somebody says to me, Pastor, you're tying on straight. Very seldom do I hear that. But I will hear Pastor Pull up, is it? I mean, give me a break. We are interested. You mean you don't, ever, you don't even say, ever see my collar on the side? To tell me to straighten up my collar? You can only see the zip. And I don't mean the one that, um, 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 and let us not nay, let all be together as some people do not bring back the scripture we had just now in 2 Peter chapter 1 verse. I'm showing you some things that you have got to add to your life to make sure that your vision is clear. In view of all this, make every effort to respond to God's promises. Supplement your faith with a generous provision of moral excellence. Moral excellence means that you're not living in sexual sin. So you have to have moral excellence. And to moral excellence, he says, add knowledge. You get knowledge through books and people and what are you making every effort to get knowledge how is the church going to grow how are you going to share the gospel the, ver the next verse says and and uh, with knowledge you add self-control these are like the drops you're dropping in your eye and to self-control you 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 add patient endurance and to patient endurance you add godliness these are all things you are playing to the eye and to godliness, you, you, you add brotherly affection. And to brotherly affection, you, you add love for everyone. Now look at the next verse. For the more you grow like, the more you grow like this, or let me, get, let me get verse 8 in the living, in the King James Version. And it will say that if you add these things, if these things be you, all those things that I just mentioned, and abound, me there's a lot, it make you that you should neither be barren nor unfruitful, in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. But verse 9. Verse 9. But he that lacketh these things. We just read those things. He that lacketh those things is blind. And cannot see afar off. Here goes the Greek language again. Where well, if you're blind you can't see afar off. That's what the translation. That's where the translation is poor. He that seeth. He that lacketh these things is blind. Can't see. And cannot see afar off. Can be translated short sighted because if the first part say that you're blind, the second part should also say that you're blind, but it translated is short sighted and cannot see afar off. And he was he is forgotten and he's purged from his old sins. We are talking about Paul, a very interesting character who was Saul of Tarsus before he met Jesus on the Damascus Road. He was on his way to persecute Christians to do wickedness. God knocked him off his horse. He was on the ground. He saw this great big light. All the, none of the persons that traveled with him saw this light. And God spoke to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the pricks. And the Lord raised him up, sent somebody to speak into his life. Sent a man by the name of Ananias. Go down by the street down there. He's at this particular house. I want you to speak to him. And as Ananias reluctantly went and laid his hands on Saul. Huh? Scales, the scales that had him blinded fell off. Let me update those scales and give them some name. I hope that by the end of the service, you'll be praying that if any of these scales are covering your eyes, that they'll drop off. The first one I said was pride. The second one I said is hatred. The other one is arrogance. That arrogance that you have in your life it's hindering you from seeing God. It's hindering you from seeing the other, the, the goodness in other people because you think that you are the creme de, de la creme, that you are the brightest part in the bunch. So you can't see goodness in anybody else because of your arrogance. Listen to the church in Revelation chapter 3 at Laodicea. We are rich. We are increasing goods. 
We have need of nothing. That's what they said. Because they lived in a society where, where um, they used to produce salve, and the place in Los Laodicea was very rich. They had a lot of people with money living there. So because of that, and that's, that's like us today, you got a little business, uh, you got a degree, or you got a house, or you drive a fancy car, and there's nobody like you. Huh? But at this church, this is not, sorry, this, this is literally said the very last one, the seventh. And hear what these people are saying. We have need of nobody. We have need of nothing. We are rich, and we are increased with goods. Look at Revelation 3, 17. If that is your attitude, you are arrogant. You're going to come to church. You're going to warm a bench all your life. And then you're going to leave. And when we meet you downtown and ask you, what happened that you're in the church anymore? Or oh, the pastor this. The people that. No, it's neither the pastor nor the people. The pastor nor the people shouldn't cause you to, to backslide and go to hell. Unless you're blind. You're going to let somebody put you in hell forevermore. I can't go to that church because of them hypocrites. You're going to let hypocrites put you in hell. Where there are billions of hypocrites. You can't take 75 hypocrites in this church. How are you going to deal with the billions in hell? That doesn't make sense. You are blind. You're not seeing right. Go down some more. Come down to the point where you see they say, I'm rich. I'm increased with God. Look what they're saying. That's some of you. You think that because God has prospered you and blessed you to be a little bit above somebody else. Remember a scripture the Lord says. The Lord says in the book of Romans, what do you have that somebody didn't give you? Why are you boasting as though somebody didn't give you what you have? Somebody gave you, your mother or father or somebody, gave you the opportunity to go to school, then gave you the opportunity to go to university, and then some business gave you the opportunity to come and work for them, and now you have a car, you have a, God bless you. I think you should get two or three or four, but put it in perspective. Look what the, this church said. I am rich. I'm increased with goods. I have need of nothing. But look what the Lord said to them. The Lord said, you don't even know that you are wretched and you are miserable and you are poor and you are blind and you are naked. Sometimes it will be good if you will humble yourself and let somebody tell you, some qualified person, some of the blind spots in your life that you can't see. Everybody has blind spots. That's why we have brothers and sisters in the church. That's why we have the fivefold ministry. That's why we have the gifts of the spirit that somebody need to come to you and say to you, look, you think that you're all that and a bag of chips. But no, look here at this life. Look here in your life. Look what is happening here. Now, I'm not talking about making a broadcast. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a one-to-one. -one. Somebody need to tell you. But you're so arrogant. Your attitude is, I'm rich. But that's only your attitude. I'm increased with goods. My cupboard is always full. I have need of nothing. I have need of nobody. But God's idea was, you are wretched. You are miserable. You are poor. You are blind. And you are naked. Brethren, is it time for you to have a spiritual vision checkup? Is it time for you to have a checkup? I think so. I think I need a checkup. No matter whether I'm seeing 2020 or not. You know, there's something better than 2020. You know, I didn't even know that. We think that 2020 is the perfect vision, but they have something called 20 over 100, which means that what you can see clearly at 20 feet away, another person can see just as clearly from 100 feet away. That's where we want to be. Brother, you don't see everything. Within the last year, I have missed about two or three pedestrians crossing the road in front of me. The church had a, the, the car has a blind spot. Huh? And when, when I see him, you know, I thank God I didn't kill somebody. On, on, on all those occasions, my wife or somebody says, look, somebody got to tell you, look. My wife is saying, you didn't see him. Somebody got to tell you that, brother, because you think you're seeing everything. You think you got it all together. These people said, I'm rich. So we have arrogance. And then selfishness. It is all about me. Look. It seems as though Paul probably only had one set of scales on his eyes, but it looked like we got a whole lot. Ours like is put together with a screw or something. They are open our eyes and, uh, and somebody need to lay hands on you or talk to you and let's get rid of these scales. 
uh, rebellion, haughtiness, high-mindedness, ignorance. Ephesians 4 and verse 18 says, ignorance can be a blinder. When I talk about scale on your eyes, think of blinkers that you put on a horse. That's what I'm talking about. Your vision is obscured. You're not seeing where you're going. And the Bible said in Proverbs chapter 29 and verse 18, that where there is no vision, the people will perish. You don't get chastisement. The Bible said having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the love of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. So the blindness is in the heart. Is there anybody getting anything for what I'm saying? If you go and read what happened to Paul, after the scales have been removed from his, from his eyes, you'll be surprised to see what happened. After the scales were removed from his eyes, look at what happened. And I'm telling you this because I want to provoke you to jealousy. I want you to go before God and say, Lord, I know I have some scales. I know these scales are blinding me. Lord, I know like Paul, I am zealous. But although I'm zealous, I'm still wrong. The Bible says in Romans chapter 1 that the Jews had a zeal, but not according to knowledge. A zeal, but not according to knowledge. I had a very good idea of that this week. We had some little boys running a, 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 a relay. The first leg went okay. The second leg went okay. When it came to the third leg and he received the baton, he started going in the opposite direction. Anybody else why I just said? Instead of going, and he, was, and he was going full blast in the opposite direction. You see, that could be happening to you. You think it is all right. Nobody's supposed to tell me anything. And you're heading in the opposite direction. You're on your way to destruction. And you don't know. But when Paul's scales were removed, according to Galatians 1 and 16, Paul saw the Lord. If you could get your skills removed. And I got to pray about this all the time. Because I said, Lord, I don't only want my skills removed for myself. I said, Lord, I have a whole family. And Lord, I have the church family. And by the way, let me tell you. And this is no lie. I don't pray for anything at all for myself. That I don't pray for you. We are all family. I want my skills removed. I want yours removed. I want to be blessed by the Lord. I want you to be blessed by the Lord. I want my children and grandchildren to serve God. I want your children and grandchildren to serve God as well. So Paul saw the Lord. When your skills are removed, they tell me that when cataracts are removed from my eyes, I'm going to see 2020. I'm going to see perfectly. I don't feel like going. And I have made up my mind to go. But that's what they say. If the spiritual cataracts are removed from your eyes, you are going to begin to see clearly. And one, of, I have four things that I have here that I want you to, to, uh, to have a look at. It seems as though we are not paying close attention to these things. And the one we are going to deal with tonight is seeing the signs that are leading up to the rapture. The signs that lead up to the rapture. The rapture is when Jesus comes and take all the Christians, both dead and living, take them up to heaven with him. And it could happen before this service is finished. But our eyes are closed. We're not looking at the signs. So tonight, I want to take some time again to show you the times, the signs of the times. And to show you that we are really in the toenails of time. We don't have as much time as you think. Let me give an example. The Bible says that the, the generation that sees the rebirth of Israel will not pass until the rapture takes place. When did the rebirth of Israel take place? 1948. This is 74 years. How long is a generation? How long is a generation? The Lord said that generation will not pass away until the rapture takes place. And there's some other things which I want to put in your head because I want you on a daily basis to be watching, to be seeing. I don't want you to be spiritually blind. And another text, I want to show you how Satan is systematically working against the church to shut us, shut us up. Tearing down churches, 
martyring Christians, all sorts of things are happening, but we are not seeing. I want to take it upon myself to draw to your attention these things that are happening all around us. But we are not seeing. We are like blind people groping in darkness. That's what Isaiah is saying. So I'm going to specify what's happening. Paul was changed by God. If you have the scales removed from your eyes this morning, you will be changed. Paul started so many churches. He became an apostle. He raised the dead. Huh? All sorts of things. He went through so much because he's now a child of God. He was shipwrecked. He was beaten. Paul's life after the scales were removed was such a contrast to what else before the scales. And you, like me, should be saying, Lord, if that is so, I want you to remove these scales. God saved him. He went to Arabia in Galatians chapter 1, and he learned the gospel. Uh, and during the next 20 years, Paul wrote most of the letters that you see in the New Testament. Most of those letters to all those churches. He started those churches. He wrote letters to them to encourage them to be, to be strong in the Lord. In other words, Paul's life before the scales were removed. And Paul's life after the scales were removed is like chalk and cheese. There is no comparison. You can only contrast them. My prayer is that God will deal with us with our spiritual short-sightedness. Those who are long-sighted, that God will do, deal with it. Those who have 2020 vision will maintain 2020 vision. Those who are totally blind, India has the largest population of blind people in the world. There are probably 40 million blind people. Because they don't have, don't, don't forget, they have 1.3 billion people. And you should watch it. These are things you should look at. See persons who were born blind. With a simple operation that can make them see. Take out front of your eye here and put in one that's made of plastic. Huh? And when those people see light for the first time. When those men are able to see their wife's face. Or their children, the face of the children. Those people think like they died and went to heaven. That is the same reaction that I want for all of us here. That God will, if you are spiritually blind, that God will remove the scales, that God will cause us to see, that God will cause us, having seen now, that we will spread the light around the world. Paul would encourage us to do that. Let me ask you a question. Is your... Are, are, are your eyes blocked by pride or hatred or arrogance or selfishness or even rebellion because you have some rebels in church? Haughtiness? What, maybe my list doesn't include your problem. What is your problem? Is it lust? Is it that you are a kleptomaniac? You can't stop stealing. Are you are whatever the case may be. What, what is your problem? What is keeping you blind? What is keeping your darkness? When you are blind, you are in darkness. What is keeping you in darkness? Look, we've got to move on. The church has got to move on. The simplicity of the gospel.